Hi, everyone. It's Lauren Steiner. Welcome to tonight's edition of The Robust Opposition. Uh, with me tonight is my, one of my favorite people, Catherine Paul, who is the Associate Director of the Organic Consumers Association. How you doing, Catherine? I'm doing great, Lauren. It's great to be on your show. Um, you do amazing work, so we, we look to you for an example, actually. Oh, well, thanks. The reason that I'm doing this show and the protest tomorrow at Ben & Jerry's, which I'm going to be talking about later, is because of the explosive findings that came out about Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Now, I've been eating Ben & Jerry's for years. I remember stopping eating Haagen-Dazs like 20 years ago when I read that they refused to not use cows that were not treated with bovine growth hormone. And um, I thought that Ben & Jerry's was a socially responsible company. Their ingredients are all natural. Um, they don't use GMO ingredients. I remember being disappointed, actually, when they stopped with their flavor, Coffee Heath Bar Crunch. It was one of my favorite flavors. Uh, and then they used another Heath Bar Crunch that was not as good as the brand. So I was disappointed in that, but I was like saying, oh, good for them because they don't want to have GMOs in their ice cream. So then I read about this study and I'm like, oh, my God. So, Catherine, tell us what you found out and what made you decide to do the study in the first place? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, we've been talking and when I say we, it's partly um our executive director, Ronnie Cummins, and Regeneration Vermont, uh, even before Regeneration Vermont existed as an organization. Uh, people who work in this field have been talking to Ben & Jerry's for a long time about the need to transition to organic um, milk for their ice cream. And the reason for that is uh, the tremendous damage that industrial dairy does to the environment and um, and by extension to human health. So it's been a long time coming trying to force them to go organic, and we've uh, we've had one we've had conversations with them for years, very intensely over the past three years, working with Ben and Jerry's, and uh, they, they just they won't move. They won't move on this issue, and yet at the same time. They uh, project this image of caring so much about the environment and climate change, and they're so progressive. But you cannot be, uh, you cannot support progressive issues and support industrial dairy at the same time. So uh, we decided to test their ice cream to see what was in it, to see if we could find some of the pesticides that we knew know are heavily used in Vermont in uh, growing the, the animal feed for the dairy cows. And sure enough, we found glyphosate in 10 out of 11 of the flavors that we tested. Wow. Now, glyphosate, glyphosate is the main ingredient in Roundup, correct? That's the pesticide that they use um, on most crops. Yes. Roundup. Uh, Monsanto's Roundup weed killer. Um, let's talk about the reaction to the testing. I read that some people were saying that the testing didn't hold up. Uh, the levels that were found were well below the levels that the FDA considered safe, that a kid would have to eat 17,000 ice cream cones a day in order to have it affect. <laughs> tell, tell us about that, the criticism and your response to it. Well, first of all, you have to consider uh, who is setting what are what people are calling safe levels of glyphosate. And uh, technically, the EPA sets those levels, the Environmental Protection Agency. And a few years ago, they, you know, after setting a particular level saying, well, you can have this much glyphosate and you're going to be fine. Um, they they came along and they actually said, oh, no, now we're going we're gonna to raise that. You can have a whole lot more glyphosate. You're still going to be fine. And they did that because Monsanto's weed killer, weeds becoming resistant. Farmers had to use more of it. Monsanto goes to the EPA and says, hey, you know, we need higher safe levels. Um, so we're working. We got so many problems here. We've got We've got that revolving door between Monsanto and the EPA and the FDA and all those government regulatory agencies. Monsanto goes, you know, 
lawyers are hired into the regulatory agencies. Um, and we have Monsanto, and we had these regulatory agencies relying on Monsanto's word. They do the testing and they say, well, you know, we can't give you all this information is proprietary, but we tested it and we say it's safe. Um, so we're, we're relying on the same agencies that told us PCBs were safe, that told us DDT, Agent Orange. I mean, we've been told over and over by government agencies that these chemicals are safe, even though corporations knew for a very long time that they weren't. And as you know, all of these documents are just recently coming to light as a result of lawsuits against Monsanto and going through the discovery process. And we're turning up all kinds of evidence that Monsanto has, in many cases, colluded with EPA officials to hide evidence about the toxicity of glyphosate. Uh, there's missing data. And they haven't really shared the data about the entire formulation for Roundup. So we don't even know really what the effect of this is, except for what Monsanto has told us. And for the testing that other scientists have done that have said the FDA's levels are wrong. It's not safe at those levels. In fact, it's very dangerous at very low levels. Um, maybe even more dangerous at lower levels, which is counterintuitive. Um, the more recent research on glyphosate points to the fact that it's that that lower levels, that it's unsafe at much, much lower levels than what the government agencies are telling us. So. And what what are the effects of glyphosate on human health? Well, one of the most recent studies uh, clearly points to fatty liver disease, which is uh, which we've, we're seeing a, a great increase in, um, which leads to eventually can lead to cirrhosis. But in the meantime, there are all kinds of other symptoms. And of course, there was the Seralini study where uh, which pointed to uh, the link between glyphosate and cancer at very low levels. Mm. Um, Monsanto went after Seralini, tried to discredit it, got that study um, unpublished, and then it was republished. And again, these court documents coming out make it very clear that, uh, that a lot of this research that's been coming out on these low levels in the toxicity, Monsanto actually has known that all along, but they, they have continued to hide it from the, well, you know. from the government. This is very interesting because it's very reminiscent of Exxon Mobil knowing about climate change for exactly. many years and hiding that from everyone also. And also the tobacco industry knowing about the dangers of smoking. And as far as this formula goes, it puts me in mind of, you know, when I fought Fran Pavley's bill, uh, SB4, which was a bill to uh, regulate fracking as if regulations could make fracking safe. Uh, one of the things that um, she wanted to have in there was disclosure of the chemicals. And we already knew what the chemicals were because they were uh, revealed at one of Henry Waxman's hearings when he was chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Now, the Sierra Club did not support that bill because they wanted to know the formula and the concentration. So apparently that made a difference. It's not just the chemicals. It's the formula and the concentration. Exactly. Now, Helen Gaskin says this, uh, that it's used on wheat. Um, and, uh, you know, you're talking about fatty liver disease. My son, who's 20 years old, uh, just gained a little bit of a weight and he's got a big stomach. You know how like men get that tire around their middle. And sure enough, we took him to, uh, you know, for a blood test. And he was diagnosed with mild fatty liver disease. It's called mild hepatic statosis. And he also had triglycerides. And when I looked into what this is on WebMD, which is a great source of information, by the way, I found that it had to do with eating a lot of carbohydrates and starch and um, specifically uh, 
my son eats a lot of bread and pasta and pizza and yeah. And I'm sure that he's, you know, the kind of fast food places that he's going to, even though I try to keep him out of them. You know, we were at California pizza kitchen the other day. I didn't ask if their pizza crust uses non GMO. I probably can't, but, um, you know, so he, he eats a whole pizza. I mean, granted it's a small pizza, but he eats a whole pizza. And before that he had two pieces of bread. So basically, I, I, I scared the shit out of him. I said, if you keep up like this, you're going to get cirrhosis of the liver. Ronnie Cummings, who is your executive director, yep. basically said that not only is uh, glyphosate harmful for human health, but the fact that, um, that, Mons that uh, Ben & Jerry's refuses to use organic milk is ruining waterways, hurling dairy farmers into bankruptcy, hurting migrant workers, and perpetuating animal abuse. Can you speak to those issues? So let's talk about the water in Vermont. And this is, uh, this is going back a few years now, which has sort of led up to this, to our testing of the ice cream. Three states in this country, there are three states where farmers are required to report the pesticides they're using. Um, they have to report them to the state environmental department agency. Um, and, and we, uh, Will Allen from Re Regeneration Vermont and Michael Colby figured this out. Those three states are Vermont, California, and New York. And they thought, well, I'm, you know, let's go look at that. Let's see what, what the farmers in Vermont are using to grow the, the, the corn and soy that they feed to the dairy cows. 96,000 acres of um, Vermont farmland is planted in GMO crops largely to feed the animals in the dairy system in Vermont. Wow. wow. Yeah. yeah, everybody thinks Vermont's all clean. So 96,000 acres of GMO crops in Vermont. What are they using on that to grow that? Glyphosate, atrazine, metolachlor, Mm. Where are those chemicals at ending up in the animal feed that the animals eat, the animals that produce the milk for the cheese and the ice cream? It ends up in Vermont's waterways. Um, so here's Ben and Jerry's not sourcing organic milk. They're using the milk that requires, that supports all this GMO monoculture and pesticide use in Vermont. So right now, Vermont taxpayers have a $2 billion bill to clean up Vermont's waterways. Lake Champlain, so polluted, people can't swim in it. The fish are dying. The state taxpayers have to clean this up. And the vast majority of that is from agricultural runoff, from the fertilizers and the pesticides used to grow the feed for the animals for the dairy cows. So um, everybody thinks of Vermont as pristine and clean and happy cows and green pastures. Uh, it's a terribly polluted state, and that's largely a result of the dairy industry there. Yes, and also um, Cabot Creamery, which is another uh, Vermont another one. business that uses, uh, apparently yeah. do not use organic milk either. I went up there and took the tour of their factory because my son was in school in Vermont for three years. And I was so impressed because it was a co-op. And you know how we like worker-owned co-ops. Mm -hmm. So it's another, it's a greenwashing issue. You think that these companies are so great and you want to patronize them. I remember when I went on, when I found out about bovine growth hormone. I mean, it was probably 24 years ago because my son was just born. And I always prided myself on saying, my son has only drank organic milk. And I remember the first milk that I was buying, and I was literally buying for about 15 years, that was Horizon. And when I went up to Vermont to visit my son, um, we were staying at a bed and breakfast that was right next door to a, a, a man who had his own little farm with a few cows there. And I thought, oh, great, let's go drink some milk directly from the cow. And I'm talking to this guy, and he told me that Horizon was one of the worst. He says they keep their cows like so close together and in humane conditions and blah, blah, yep. blah. And he recommended Organic Valley. 
So, okay, I now switched to Organic Valley and I'm patting myself on the back because I think Organic Valley is such a great company. And then, of course, last year when I was fighting the new dark act, which we're going to talk about a little later on, I find out that, uh, that yes, they do use organic milk and yes, maybe they do keep their cows in more humane conditions, but the Organic Grocery Association gave um, legislators political cover for voting yep. for the new for the new dark act because they said oh if if organic uh, D- um, valley and stonyfield are all behind this then it must be good right yep yep that was the organic trade association yeah the yeah, organic it's difficult it's difficult um, yeah organic valley's milk is better than horizons you're better off buying it but that was a very disappointing um, decision by that company so um, I'm lucky. I live in Maine. I can find a lot of local organic milk. Um, yeah. Not everybody has that option, of course. But you did raise the issue of the animals. Um, that's another thing. The average lifespan of a cow would be 15 to 20 years. The dairy industry, they're lucky if they last six years. They're oh. constantly uh, having hoof problems and mastitis. They're kept indoors, crammed in awful conditions. They live miserable lives for six years. And then this is another interesting number. A lot of people don't realize this. We're not really just talking about the dairy industry. These animals, 57% of dairy cows end up being slaughtered for beef. And mm. then, and, and so they've only lived six years. It's been mostly miserable. Mm. They're not healthy. And then they go into the beef industry. Um, it's and it's not necessary. There are organic farmers in Vermont, um, but they need a market. They need a market right now. They're having to sell for less money than it makes takes them to produce that milk um, because they don't have enough buyers for the organic milk. They need a Ben and Jerry. They need a Cabot cheese to step up. Buy organic. Consumers want it. Ben and Jerry's presents themselves as caring about all of these issues. Um, they care about the environment, but you can't you it, you can't care about the environment and support GMO monocultures and all of that all that goes with those the pesticide use, the destruction of the soil, the climate issues, and animal abuse. You just you just can't. So. Well, let me let me put this comment up here because this this may be a little bit of a tangent, but it, it kind of goes in line with what um, I read the Vox article that I was telling you about, about mm-hmm. 150 Nobel laureates who uh, wrote a letter to Greenpeace saying, stop fighting GMOs. GMOs are fine. Your science is junk science. Um Really, we need them to, uh, you know, they've, they've been breeding plants for centuries, plants breed naturally, blah, 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 blah. I wanted to ask you what you have to say to that. But Dawn made a good point because, yes, um, and, and population is an issue uh, and feeding people. I mean, that's how this whole thing got started in the first place. So how do we w- w- walk a fine balance Because, yes, organic is so expensive now because of the fact that they're subsidizing the crap instead of subsidizing the good stuff, which is one thing that they can do. Um, But, yes, volume volume is important. I mean, I have a lot of friends. They've been begging me to go vegetarian and vegan, and I love meat. I don't eat a lot of it. Um, I feel we're omnivores. We were born to eat meat. Animals kill other animals. I got a whole bunch of rationalizations that nobody needs to hear right now. But what about this this point that, that Dawn brings up about how many people we need to feed? I would be happy to send along numerous studies from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and others that say, you know, this is not the solution to feeding the world. Growing millions of acres of pesticide-drenched GMO corn and soy is not how we feed the world. If it were how we fed the world, we wouldn't have this increasing issue of hunger. Um, How many kids, there was a recent study about children just in the US who are not getting enough to eat. 
That's not because we're not growing enough GMO corn and soy. Uh, these are other issues that have to do with hunger. It's poverty, it's food distribution. Um, but as the Food and Agriculture Organization and other reputable organizations have uh, pointed out, uh, GMO crops are not the solution to feeding the world. Um, small, uh, small farmers right now are feeding more people on fewer acres. Um, and and it's not it's not what people eat. I mean, in it, we're forty percent of GMO <coughs> corn goes to making ethanol. Right. Um, we're we're polluting. We're ruining our soil. We're polluting our waterways. We're making ourselves unhealthy so that we can grow GMO crops. It's not the solution to hunger. And I'm happy to share some of the links that that really put out all the um, statistics on that because it's a myth. It's a myth perpetuated by the biotechnology industry. They want us to think that they're feeding the world, but Monsanto is not feeding the world. Let's go on to what their director of social mission uh, told you when you came to him with these studies. I mean, they said that they are transitioning uh, and they don't know where these um, GMOs are coming from. They could be migrating from somewhere else. So that was the social mission director at Ben and Jerry's. That oh, was ben an and Jerry's. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And that was an interesting comment. Um, first of all, we didn't find GMOs in their ice cream. We found glyphosate. That's the pesticide that's used to grow GMO crops. So technically speaking, um, there are not GMOs in the ice cream. What there is in that ice cream is glyphosate. Um, traces of the weed killer used to grow the animal feed. So that's, that's all well and good to get the glyphosate out of their ice cream. They should do that because the latest research um, points to the fact that no matter how small an amount, it's dangerous and it shouldn't be in there. Good. Get the glyphosate out of the ice cream. But get the glyphosate out of the water. Get the glyphosate out of the soil. And unless you transition to organic, which means no GMO animal feed for the dairy cows, you're, you're contributing to the pollution of Vermont's water. It ends up in people's drinking water. We know that. We've done testing. We've had, when we ran tests and other organizations offer glyphosate testing to people, 90% of us have glyphosate in our bodies. We're getting it in our drinking water, even if we're eating organic foods. Now, um, you were telling me earlier about Will Allen from Cedar Circle Farms, and he's 80 mm -hmm. years old, and he's been dealing with this for a long time. You told me that he's been going to Ben and Jerry's offices, and they keep telling him they're going to do this, and now he's just... T tell me, tell the, the viewers what you told me earlier. We've, we've tried playing nice with Ben and Jarrah's, and that's kind of why we did this testing, because we, we, needed, we needed something that would get people's attention, something to bust this myth that Ben and Jerry's is this squeaky clean company that cares, you know, about all these social myths. You, you said it best, you know. Um, it, they, they talk so much about getting money out of politics. Well, let's, let's get glyphosate out of their ice cream, right? Well, here's another interesting statistic. 55% of consumers will pay more for a product from a company that has a social mission component. Ben & Jerry's knows that. They're charging a premium for their product because they think people will like them because they do all of these good things. But, but they are so profitable. They are such a huge company. Of course, they're owned by Unilever now, but they pretend that they aren't. They don't really want to talk about that. They pretend that they make all the decisions right there in Vermont. And they're, you know, they're just the same as they always were, you know, these, these good, caring people. They're greenwashing. It's greenwashing um, to the nth degree, and this is deception. It's 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 deceiving consumers into thinking 
that they care about your environment, they care about your clean water, they care about social justice issues and climate change, um, but they're they're just talking the talk. They're not walking the walk. Yeah, well, it was interesting because when I read uh, Michael Colby's article in Counterpunch, I saw that this predated their being bought out by Unilever. And Ben Cohen said himself when they owned the company that they didn't want to do it because of the cost. Now, I will tell you that I don't know that they charge a premium. Maybe they charge a premium over Briars or Dryers or some of these other supermarket brands. But the, one of the reasons that I've always liked Ben and Jerry's, in addition to their fantastic flavors and being, like I thought, all natural, <laughs> is that I can actually get it now in Ralph's for three fifty four dollars whereas, you know, the twin, the three twins, as we talked about, which we'll be serving tomorrow for free, everyone, um, you know, costs $6. And some of these other local brands, I go into Whole Foods or any of these other markets where I shop, and they're all, you know, seven dollars. Some of them are eight dollars. They uh, they may be charging a premium to the absolute shittiest ice cream, but they're still relatively affordable. So now, okay, let's talk about the protest tomorrow. So you contacted me and asked me if I would be one of the organizers of these protests that you're doing in multiple cities. Yeah. Tell us, tell us how you got the idea to do the protests what the concept is, and how many cities. When the story broke in the New York Times, it went crazy. It was picked up in so many outlets, we couldn't even keep up with counting them. It was translated into French and Spanish and Portuguese and Japanese. Um, that's a start. It was, it was, it's good. It's good to get the word out there, but we need to keep educating consumers. So the protests are partly to get the word out to consumers and to get the word out to Ben and Jerry's that we're serious. We're serious about this. We are not going to let up until this company agrees to go organic. So uh, we'll have people in dressed in hazmat suits um, dumping what we now call Ben and Jerry's Roundup Ready ice cream. Um, we've, we've created a new flavor for them. <laughs> And uh, just as you have Roundup Ready corn, we now have Roundup Ready ice cream, Ben & Jerry's new flavor. And we're going to do these protests uh, tomorrow in Burlington, Vermont, of course. We need one there. New York City, Chicago. You're doing the one in Santa Monica. That's the L.A. market. Um, Minneapolis and Austin, Texas. We're going to do like a little skit. We're going to send some of our people in and then they're going to come out and then we're going to tell them we are confiscating your ice cream because it's toxic and then dumping it and getting their reaction. And then, of course, to the real customers, we'll just tell them what's going on and hand out the flyers. And uh, some of our people, they don't want to dump their ice cream. They want to go back inside and see if they can get a refund. If they tell the workers why they want the refund, then I'll be there live streaming the whole thing. There's too many protests with a bunch of speeches. And, you know, it's nice to do something that's like a street theater, if you will. And this certainly will be. I participated in a citizen lobby visit with Diane Feinstein's office at, um, last year about this new dark act. Um, and can you describe for people that aren't familiar with it what the the new dark act was with the QR codes and everything? Uh, it was essentially uh, thanks to Monsanto and the grocery manufacturers industry um, association, basically big food and big biotech managed to uh, they they fought so hard to keep from getting any of these state GMO labeling laws passed. But Vermont had passed and it went into effect last year on July 1st. And in fact, companies were already labeling and the sky was not falling. But um, within two weeks of that uh, law taking effect in Vermont, a federal law was passed to preempt it. Now, of course, what they wanted to tell us uh, what Congress wanted to tell us and the industry wanted to tell us was that this was a, a federal GMO labeling law so that this would be uniform in all the states and 
You wouldn't have this. They love to use the word. We wouldn't have this patchwork of state laws. We'd have this one big, beautiful federal GMO labeling law. However, that law was so full of loopholes, is so full of loopholes, that hardly any products would have to be labeled anyway. And they said, well, you don't really have to put the label on the product. We, you can use a QR code instead. So people have to have a smartphone and they have to scan the product, which takes them to the website of the company where they dig around and try to find out if this product has GMOs, which is a far cry from having a couple of words on a label that says this product contains GMOs. So it's, it's essentially a worthless piece of legislation. It doesn't help consumers at all. It was clearly intended to keep this information off of packages so consumers can't easily know whether or not a product contains GMOs. So it prevented Vermont's GMO labeling law from going into effect is what happened. Well, yeah, the law went into effect for two whole weeks and then it was yeah. preempted. Yeah, and when I was doing uh, this citizen lobby meeting, someone mentioned the statistic, and you know I find this hard to believe because it seems like when you walk down the street, everybody's staring at their smartphone, but apparently only 33% of Americans have smartphones. And then, like you said, with the QR code, you know, we gave the example, imagine a mother pushing a shopping cart down the aisle with a toddler on her yeah. hip, having to take out the smartphone, going to the QR code app reader, you know, reader app. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. Or I guess you could have called an 800 number. I mean, who's going to go through that? Who's going to do that for every product that you're trying to pick off of a shelf? I mean, yeah. especially when and there are arguments, of, aside from the patchwork thing, was, oh, this was going to cost company so much money and that was going to be passed on to consumers. But study after study after study proved that to be absolutely false. They label these products in 64 other countries. Yeah. It didn't affect the price. And when Campbell's, I called Campbell's up when they announced that they were going to start labeling. And I said, so you're going to start charging more for your products because you've got to put four words on a label. And they said, absolutely not. I mean, everybody knows they change those labels. They change their packaging all the time. It, it was just a, a bogus argument to keep that information off. And you know what? I have a smartphone, but I don't know about anybody else. If you're in a store with a lot of aisles, it's something about the way the aisles are in stores. Half the time, my phone doesn't work in a grocery store. If I'm in a big store, it doesn't work in, a, in any of the in the big stores where you have tall walls and aisles. What is the next step with labeling? Are we going to be pushing forward on this or have we given up? Labeling was was a tool basically to educate consumers about what's in their food and to get them to stop buying it so that we take, you know, we we kill off this market for GMO products. So uh, we're really focused. I can't speak for other organizations. I mean, we've got the Trump administration right now. Uh, we, what are we going to do with that? I mean, the EPA overturned a ban on a very dangerous pesticide called chlorpyrifos just recently. Mm. We finally got it banned. The Scott Pruitt comes in under the Trump administration and overturns the ban. Uh, it's a hopeless situation at the federal level and since they've preempted it, you know, at the state level. So our organization isn't focused on labeling per se right now. We're focused on getting rid of this stuff, getting people to connect the dots between GMO monocultures, what they do to the soil, what damaging the soil does to the quality of the food that you grow, what it does in terms of pollution to the environment, what that all does to your health and the fact that you know when you tie it all up it's also one of the biggest contributors to global warming we're trying to get people to broaden their focus look at the big picture and understand our real goal here has to be to transition to agriculture that works with nature um, to build organic soil matter, to grow nutritious, nutrient-dense food, and to get all these pollutants out of our environment, out of our water, out of our food. Um, because cheap 
cheap fruit isn't cheap. It's killing us. Somebody's got to clean up the mess. Vermont taxpayers got to fork out $2 billion to clean up a lake, for crying out loud. It's, it's not cheap food. We pay for it one way or another. Well, as you know, all these issues are connected, and they all come back to money and politics and how corporations have more control yes. over politicians. I mean, even with the Dianne Feinstein thing, her aide sat there and listened sympathetically to all our points and nodded and took notes. And then a week later, Dianne Feinstein votes for the new Dark Act, and it turns out that she's taken $1.6 million from Monsanto. And then, of course, Pat Roberts, who's the Republican head of the Agriculture Committee, and Debbie Stabenow, who's the Democrat, the ranking member of the committee, um, also were the two senators to receive the most money from big agriculture. So Ben is right. He does need to get money out of politics. But first, he needs to get glyphosate <laughs> out of my ice cream. All yes. right. There. Yes, I've they do. It. All you right. Did. All right. Thank you so much for being on, Catherine. Um, it's actually, you mentioned it on your uh, Facebook page right away, say we should protest this. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm glad we reached out to you because you'll do a great job there. Getting the media out these days is tough. I mean, you know, when you've got uh, saber rattling and the possibility of a nuclear war, it's hard to get people out to get the media out to take pictures at a ice cream protest. But I'll be uh I'll be on the phones to them again tomorrow. We'll keep it up. We'll try to get some coverage. We're putting out a national press release talking about, you know, that we're doing this in all eight cities. We think that'll get some attention, too. We know it's already got Ben and Jerry's attention. Um, and we're going to keep on them. We're going to keep on them until they make this because this is doable. They can do this. And if they did it, other companies would follow and it would be a tremendous success for uh, for the environment, for everybody. Yeah, I think it's a very strategic protest. And your idea of putting the onus on the corporations now, because it's going to be easier to influence them through our consumer behavior, which is the name of your organization, after all, uh, than it is to influence, um, you know, the Trump administration and the bought out legislators from both parties. Hi, everyone. This is Lauren Steiner for The Robust Opposition, coming to you live from Ben & Jerry's here on Main Street in Santa Monica. Oh, hey, hey, ho, ho, glyphosate has got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho, glyphosate has got to go. 120% of the daily dose required to trigger fatty liver disease. For a 150-pound adult, less than a pint would do the same. Now, I know adults who sometimes go through a pint of Ben and Jerry's a night, and I'm not going to name them. It may have even been me at one point. Ben and Jerry's, the $1.3 billion subsidiary of Unilever, has made a fortune off of its claims of social responsibility and respect for the earth. By refusing to switch, they contribute to global warming. More than 92,000 acres of Vermont's farmland is planted in corn grown for animal feed. 96% of that corn is GMO. GMO monocultures destroy the soil's ability to draw down and sequester carbon. But no way can Ben & Jerry support the company's claim that it cares about the environment, much less social and economic justice or global warming, as long as it continues to profit by supporting an environmentally disastrous industrial dairy system instead of Vermont's organic dairy farms. Call Ben and Jerry's at 802-846-1500 and ask the company to go organic. That's 802-846-1500. Ben and Jerry, you can't hide. We can see your corporate side. Ben and Jerry, you can't hide. We can see your corporate side. Ben and Jerry, what do you say? Buy organic milk today. Ben and Jerry, what do you say? Buy organic milk today. I can't allow you to eat that ice cream. It's toxic. Oh no, why? 
It contains traces of glyphosate. Monsanto's uh, weed one, uh, one of the great main ingredients in Monsanto's weed killer roundup. We're going to have to dispose of your ice cream. We'll be back. It's got a, a lot of wonderful organic flavors here. Chocolate orange confetti. Uh, cookies and cream. Or Madagascar vanilla. What would you like? ICC salted. I'll, I'll take that one. Ah, oh, the sea salted pecan. Ah, oh, a wonderful choice. What, what brought you here today? Because obviously you're, you're a busy lady. Uh, why did you take time out to, to be here at this protest? I am. You know, actually, I closed down my shop to make it out here in support of this because I think it's incredibly irresponsible for a company that deems itself to be so organic and progressive um, to, to have traces of glyphosate in their ice cream is just you know, not um, something that we can accept. And um, hoping that they will hear our call and make the changes that need to get made um, and be responsible about it, you know? it's We're not asking for too much here. It's pretty simple. First of all, what brought you here? And, and why are you so excited to uh, share this message? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm here to meet other people that are questioning whether or not their gluten allergy or so-called gluten sensitivity is actually a sensitivity to glyphosate. I've been gluten-free for over 10 years. I went to Europe and ate bread there. I was fine. It was very, very surprising. I thought I was cured. I came back to the United States, ate bread, and immediately got sick again. And I didn't, I couldn't explain it, so I just kind of like shrugged it off, went back on a gluten-free diet for many years. and. Last year, I started getting sick in the same similar way, but to oatmeal. So I was getting sick every morning, eating oatmeal, and I didn't know why. And my boyfriend was like, well, we didn't, we stopped buying organic. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But we got organic, and I was fine again. And then going online, I found that there is really high, illegally high levels of glyphosate now in oatmeal. Folks like you, you might not necessarily have a, a gluten intolerance or celiac disease, but it's the way it's produced these days where there, it's really just the, the profit motive is corrupting our food system and you, you become the victim of that. I'm here to support her because it seems like something pretty terrible is going on that's affecting people's health and especially I think eating organic has helped her stay in good health. Um, so I think something's going on here and I think it has to do with glyphosate. So I think we should get rid of it. Don't Ben and Jerry's, go organic. Well, I never buy Ben and Jerry's ice cream myself. You know, I'm so you're ahead of the curve. I guess so. I don't know. I, I'm always looking for the healthy options. It's tough to know what's in our food, I guess. So yeah. it's good that you guys are doing the research and uh, I'll support the support the cause. So Lorna Paisley now is going to take the stage and she is with Label GMOs. Take it away, Lorna. Money talks to these people and greed controls them. When the Dark Act passed, it was a sham bill. Companies have no consequences if they don't label their food. They can use QR codes and 800 numbers as a source of information on GMOs. So that's fine, but if you don't have a phone with you or worse yet a smartphone, you will not be able to check on whether or not your food contains GMOs, which of course have glyphosate. When the Dark Act came before the Senate, hundreds of phone calls were made to Diane Feinstein. She voted for the act anyway. Maybe the fact that she got $1,645,599 from big agribusiness had something to do with the way she voted. A free scoop of ice cream for you, sir. Ben & Jerry's has Roundup in it, which is a weed killer. You don't want to be eating weed killers, do you? No. How did you feel about some free ice cream here today? Feel great. All right, why don't you go and then tell them what flavor you want. Right over here. You want to text Dirty Dairy, D-I-R-T-Y, D-A-R-Y, to 9779. That's 9779. Also go to their Facebook page, tweet them, uh, at Ben and Jerry's, the and is spelled out, and tell them that you want them to switch to organic milk, right? Switch to organic milk. And tell Ben Cohen, who I interviewed actually on my show, while we love the fact that he's trying to get money out of politics, we would prefer that he gets glyphosate out of our ice cream. So thank you and good night from Santa Monica.